I'm the director of the Writing in the Disciplines program here at GW, and I'm joined by my colleague Lowell Abrams, who's in the Department of Mathematics. And Lowell won the We Distinguished Teaching Award several years ago, and so um, we're really so pleased to be able to partner with him and to learn uh, with him about his teaching. I'm going to start by just saying a very few words about WID, and then I'm going to turn it over to Lowell, who's going to talk about an example of his writing pedagogy from a class that he teaches. And so I want to point out two things about WID. First of all, Writing in the Disciplines is a course that all students take at GW, but in different departments. And so students, after they take first year writing, must take writing intensive courses in different semesters because we want them to receive sustained attention to their writing. What that means, though, is students are taking different kinds of WID courses. They're taking WID in math, they're taking WID in English, they're taking WID in business, they're taking WID in psychology, they're taking WID in biology, and that means that the practices and genres of writing in those courses vary tremendously. Because if you think about what a good English paper looks like, that's extraordinarily different than what a good, writing a good lab report looks like. And so what's interesting about WID is that um, students are doing different kinds of writing. Um, what's confusing to students, however, is that what is good writing in an English course is tremendously different than what good writing is in a math course. And it's not because um, we're being inconsistent, but rather because the genres of those fields are different from each other. And so one of the important pedagogical things for faculty remember, to remember about WID is that you need to focus on with students, what are we doing here? What does good writing look like here? And how and why might it be different in other courses that you might be taking simultaneously? WID also involves, and this is the second part of what I want to say, attention to the practices and processes of writing. Writing as thinking. So as Hartman has just talked about, what we spend a lot of time in WID on is giving students the opportunity to use writing as a mode of processing the content that they're working with. So we spend a lot of time revising, doing peer review, giving comment students comments on, on their papers so that they have the opportunity to use writing as a mode of thinking through the particular content and the particular genres that they're working with. All right, so that's a lot of big meta stuff about WID. And I'm now going to turn it over to Lowell, who's going to give us an example of the kind of writing that he does in mathematics. Um, and one of the things, again, to keep in mind is this is a very specific example. And if, what we, if we had more time, what I would have liked to have done is juxtapose good writing in math with, let's say, good writing in history, um, because those modes will look so different. But Lowell has developed some really phenomenal ways of um, working with his students. And so I'm going to turn it over to him, and then we'll open it up for questions. Sorry, I'm just going to grab my water. Um, so the key to getting students to write so mathematics is, number one, to get them to realize why they're writing. Okay? And so they have to start seeing their problems as prompts to write. Um, there are, OK. Um, variety of possibilities for what the goal might be when you are writing a solution to a math problem. Okay? And this is kind of what Rachel was saying, that different genres of writing have different goals. Okay? And you have to understand the goal of the genre you're writing within, because it does make a difference in terms of structuring what you write and choosing the words and, and uh, determining whether or not you've accomplished your goal. Right? would require knowing the goal. So one thing, and students tend to think that this is what you write math for, is to certify that the writer knows something. So they wrote the answer to the problem, and now the professor knows that the student knows how to do the problem, and they get credit for it. <laughs> but that's not what we really want to write math for. Okay? That's, that's what students write math for, but if you want to teach them the genre, you're not teaching them to be students. They're students so they can learn to be something other than a student. Okay? So that is not the goal. Um, you might think that the goal of, of writing a solution down is to record the argument. 
And of course there's um, legitimacy to this, but I don't see this as really the goal either. It's not just um, an archival record of some argument, some um, solution. Interestingly, even when you're writing a proof, so you're trying to prove that some statement is true, you are not, the goal is not to persuade the reader. That's the wrong way to think about it, okay? Because you can persuade the reader in many ways that wouldn't be considered legitimate mathematics. You don't have to use logic to persuade someone. But to write good mathematics, you must use good logic. So it's not about persuasion, okay? And that's a little bit surprising sometimes. We write proofs and we want people to believe them when they're done, but it's more than persuading them. So the idea, I think, subject to further thought, that the bottom line is we want the readers to go through a thought process. And when they get to the end, they've gone through exactly the thought process necessary to see that the statement is true. That answer really is the answer. You have, it's not, they will be persuaded, but because they've experienced the, the logic of the argument themselves. And so you want to bring the student through that. You want to bring the reader, sorry, I want to bring students through it too, but I want to, you want to bring your reader through that process. So that's the governing goal. Okay, so here's a problem. This is kind of a problem you might see on a pre-calc test. Um, well, you might see it in a variety of different courses, but this is a very simple approach of taking a pre-calc approach. And here's what you, if you get that problem, find equations of lines tangent to the circle. Tangent means it touches the circle at one point. Here's the circle at squared plus y squared equals five, going through the point minus five minus five. Okay, this is the point. Out here, it's not on the circle. There's a tangent that hits the circle. Where does it hit the circle? Okay, and then what is the equation of the line? That's really the question. Okay, and so then what you have on the right is what you would very often see a student hand here. Okay, now what does the student think they're doing? Well, they're either recording the argument, or they're trying to demonstrate they know what to do, but they are not writing something designed to enable a reader to go through the thought process they went through. So it's always disappointing to get that, and so we're often disappointed. <laughs> that's, well, that's the way it goes. So problems. Okay, there's a variety of problems, sort of on a more uh, fundamental level. First of all, not every argument is linear. The logic isn't necessarily linear. You have branching and different cases to consider and different routes to go down and, and deal with, but what's written there is linear. So the writing doesn't even reflect the structure of the logic. Okay, that's a failing. And there's no distinction between those parts. It's just line, 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 line. Are they all equally significant? Not necessarily. There are you know, points where you've achieved a sub-goal, and then you go to do some, next, some steps and achieve another sub-goal, and you want those sub-goals to stand out as markers in the writing, but this, this solution does not show that anything like that. There's no sense of hierarchy. There's no indication of how to transition from one line to the next. Okay. It's like a two-column proof if you were subjected to two-column proofs in geometry in high school or later. Um, it's a two-column proof without the second column. All right. So that's definitely a failing. And then this ties in with the idea that the only way to really understand what's on that side is to already know how to do the problem. Then I can check, yes, those steps match the thought process that I know to go through. Oh, so they, they must have gone through it but they are not, in real life, supposed to be writing for the professor. They're supposed to learn how to write for people who actually want to know what they figured out. Okay, so, so this writing doesn't achieve any of this. Okay, so there's a solution. Now, 
I don't actually imagine I would ever receive such a solution on an exam. Okay, that's, that's quite elaborate. But, um, well, maybe on an exam in a proof writing course for math majors, you might hope to get something close to this. But that's really the whole thing. Okay, you don't have to read the whole thing. You can glance through it, see that there are, first of all, English words. It still looks linear, but it's not. Okay, and I will show you how I've made it clear to the reader that it is not a linear argument. Okay, there is a branch in there. Okay, so first of all, all the lines of mathematical notation are in here, every single one. That's how I wrote this, in fact. Well, I'm sorry, it's backwards. I wrote this, then I extracted the lines. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's. So they're all in there. Everything else is to structure it. And this is the key, comes in the key pieces of the complement of the just raw mathematical notation. Okay, and I want to focus on first these words here. So the first word, let, I find to be a very interesting word. Because let opens a conversation, so to speak. You're saying to the reader, do something. Let. Let this be true. Okay? Okay, that's a, that's a very subtle little point. Whether it really works or not, I don't know. But, but it's there. Another word that's not, I didn't use, but often shows up is consider. Consider the following equation. On the left-hand side, you have this. On the right-hand side, you have that. Well, what did, what did the consider the following equation do? What was consider for? Consider was to say, okay, you're about to do something with me. You're going to go through a thought process with me, the writer. Okay? So that word is there. And then we have, we obtain, we see, which is really saying, I hope you do too, because you're part of this. Right? Even things like simplifies to is different than saying, um, well, it's saying I expect you, the reader, to do something. I expect you to be doing that simplification. I'm not going to write it down. It simplifies. Okay? So that's kind of an abusing the relation. Okay, so. Plugging this back into is an action. So I'm not just saying, because I have A and I have B, it follows by the rule of substitution that, which is how Euclid would write proofs, right? From line two and line seven, line nine follows by substitution. Okay? Plugging it back in is an action, and you're asking the reader to do it. Okay, so those are just some, some of the words. Now, I wanted to emphasize some of the structural aspects of my solution. So we're talking about a circle, and up there I say, so that a squared plus b squared equals 5. I introduce some notation, and we get an equation for the circle. Uh, we get an, a, an equation that the point AB has to satisfy, I should say. And then later on, I say, since this is true, so I remind the reader that this is a fact I've established before, but now you need to reintegrate it into what you're doing. And then I say it explicitly, plugging this back into the equation for the circle, instead of just saying, this follows from everything above, I tell the reader, here's the action that you need to do to follow this next assertion. So the, the proof, uh, kind of refers to itself explicitly, and I'm trying to help the reader go through the process of seeing the interconnections. Here's some more words, okay? It readily simplifies to b plus one equals a. Using the relation b plus one equals a. So I repeat it. It's, it's equivalent logically to saying from line nine we have but I call it a relation. I tell the, user, the reader we're going to use that relation. Okay. 
and so they're seeing, again, the interconnection, and the, the thought process. I came up with something, and now I'm going to use it. Okay? And here's where you get a kind of branching. So we're dealing with, an, with a quadratic equation, and typically, although not always, quadratic equation gives two solutions. Okay? So you get two solutions. So I have to tell the reader, there's two solutions. And I say, and. <laughs> okay, the first and isn't such a big deal. But I say and again, and then and again. And I intentionally use exactly the same word. So that the reader is aware that there's two parallel strands running through the last few lines of the proof. This and this, and this and this, and this and this, and in each case, the first and this lined up, second lined up. Two solutions. Two possibilities, okay? That emphasizes that it's two becomes two, and the and tells you you can follow it, and respectively just hits them on the head and says again, because what does the word respectively mean? Respectively means you've got a couple things here and a couple things here, and they line up this way. This one respectively, this one. Okay? So I'm just emphasizing that. So this way, the reader's hyper aware of the structure of the argument. Okay? Obviously, this is a very simple argument, and if the student has the mathematical ability to produce a paragraph like this, they probably didn't need to be told that there's things going on in parallel. But this is about learning the skill of writing, and if they don't do it here, where the structure is obvious, then when the structure is not obvious, the reader will be totally lost. So it's, it's essential. Okay? And that's the end. Now we're... Okay. Um, now we're going to turn it over to you. We have about 10 minutes for questions, discussion.